Judge Crawford, it is a great privilege to interview you for the Eminent Scholars Archive here in the Peace Palace in The Hague after a remarkable career in international law. During these interviews... Great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Have you here. Thank you so much. I hope that we'll be able to throw light on some of your major achievements spanning nearly half a century of dedication to your chosen subject that began in Oxford in the early 70s. We might characterise your career as three intertwined trajectories, your United Nations work, which culminated as a rapporteur for the International Law Commission and now as judge at the International Court of Justice, your professional practice where you've been involved in at least 120 cases and arbitrations as counsel, judge and arbitrator, and finally, but not least, your outstanding academic achievements in which you held three professorships most recently as the 10th incumbent of the Euro Chair in International Law at Cambridge. Could we start this inspiring journey with your early life in the state of South Australia? You were born in Adelaide in 1948. Yes. I don't remember that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I very much grew up in Adelaide. <clears throat> the first time I travelled overseas was in uh, 19... 71, when I was already 23, so I, <clears throat> well, I travelled a bit in Australia, uh, not, not very much, and I was basically located in Adelaide, I had my um, school, entire school career and entire undergraduate career in Adelaide, and I was very much a person from that not very large capital city. Your parents, Judge Crawford? Um, my parents were, and my father was a company director and salesman of m motor vehicles and continued the family company established by my grandfather, who had not been to university, in fact left school because of family poverty at the age of 13, um, and built up a, a significant business. He was a sort of intellectual monkey. He used to go to conferences and read a lot and had wide-ranging interests, but no formal education at all. I think a story in that generation. He was born in, in the 1890s. And a story which is not very unusual in Australia. My father never went, no, neither of my parents went to university. And my father went straight into the into business. He was in the, during the Second World War, he drove trucks, he was in the transport division of the army. My mother was a nurse in um, rural, I think Victoria, um, or maybe in South Australia. Uh, her father was an Anglican priest. Her mother was, uh, by education, a lawyer. Well, she gave up the practice of law when she married, as was common, more or less de rigueur in those days. Um, she was the second woman law graduate of Adelaide University in the 1920s, early 1920s, and was a very intellectual woman. So the, there was education on my mother's side, but my mother was a nurse and never went to university. My parents eventually had seven children, of which I was the oldest. Your school days, the school that you went to, any memories of that? Your early well, school vivid days? memories uh, was the local primary school. I never went to a, to a private school. Uh, my father gave me the option of going to a private school at secondary level, but I chose the local high school. Um, the primary school was basic primary school. Um, of course, you remember it vividly, remember the teachers and so on. The high school was, I think, quite a good high school, Brighton High School. Um, a 20 minute bike ride from home. And I had very, very good teachers there, um, many of whom I remember vividly. So it was a, it was a happy childhood, no particular special features and 
nothing especially distinguishing. I, I did well at school. Once it had been realised that I had short sighted and needed glasses uh, at primary school, uh, my grades <laughs> improved dramatically when I could see the blackboard. Um, but, uh, and then at high school, I was involved in quite a lot of extracurricular activities, uh, not so much sport. I played cricket, but more later on. Um, but in all the clubs and debating and things like that, I was head prefect of the school. Um, so it was, a, it was a happy school life, and it, broadly speaking, undistinguished. We'll touch on that briefly when we talk about your first script, where um, Professor Shearer mentions some of your accomplishments at school. Um, but for now, uh, could you say what the dominant factors in your life in Australia were at that period, bearing in mind it was perhaps a time of post-war expansion, some prosperity, immigration and perhaps loosening of ties with the UK? Yes, I, I was um, I remember looking at television, watching um, Sputnik go overhead, the first manned space flights in the 50s. Um, I remember we were the first house in the street to get television, black and white. We used to sit and watch the test pattern um, in those innocent days. Um, I was much affected by the Vietnam War, um, I was really the Vietnam War generation. Um, there was a form of conscription in Australia whereby um, you had your, your numbers were balanced, your, your birthdays were balanced, um, and if your birthday came up, you were conscripted into the army and could be sent to Vietnam. It was a question of conscience, in a way, whether to al allow yourself to be balanced because you could opt out and, as a conscientious objector, in which case you would be called up, so you could take the risk. And I took the risk and was balanced out. My best friend at the time took the risk and was balloted in, but he, although he was a very active sportsman, the doctor said there were better things for him to do than to go to Vietnam and he would count him as being unfit for service. So it was a you know, different ways of achieving the same result of not serving in the army. Um, I remember I participated in a few anti-Vietnam demonstrations I remember a Quaker demonstration standing in front of Parliament House. Um, in those days I was much concerned with church affairs. I ran the local boys club at our local parish church and was head sacristan and things like that. That disappeared later on. Um, so uh, I, I suppose the strongest influence apart from my parents and the school was the development of Australia's international relations with some emphasis on Vietnam and the increasing influence of the United States as compared to the United Kingdom. I vividly remember in the early 50s when the Queen visited Australia and the children of our school and I think of all the other schools in the Metropolitan area were bussed to the local um, race course and spread out for the Queen to come and see us, uh, no doubt with our sandwiches and so on. And I remember the Queen driving past at speed. Uh, we sat in the sun for five hours and saw the Queen for literally two minutes. I wasn't terribly impressed. I've never been a strong royalist. Uh, I was very, I'm very much in favour of an Australian Republic. Um, and that's, an, I think, an increasing view of my generation. Uh, though it would have been true of my parents as well. I think they, my, my father was on the Labour side of politics and um, supported Labour members of Parliament and things like that, which was unusual for a businessman. Um, but, enlightened in terms of public affairs.
Were you conscious growing up in South Australia of a sense of perhaps isolation? I wasn't conscious at the time, but I became conscious later on. And when it, the question arose of going back to South Australia after my the work I'd done at the PhD work I'd done in Oxford. Um, and I, th I think it, it influenced my choice of going into an academic career. I, t I couldn't until I w worked for a couple of months over a summer with a local law firm. Uh, it felt very parochial. And I, I couldn't think of myself as having a professional career in Adelaide. It was just not big enough. And had, I, had I grown up in Sydney, <coughs> I might have gone to the bar at Sydney because I was interested in public speaking and um, always, always had in mind so some part of a career as a barrister, <coughs> but not in Adelaide. In fact, Adelaide didn't have a separate bar at that stage. had a small voluntary bar, but it wasn't organised as the Eastern States were organised as separate solicitors and barristers. And it was just too small to generate large amounts of, of interesting legal practice. And, and I think it still is, in a way. It's, uh, it's sort of largely concentrated in the Eastern States. There's never been a South Australian judge on the High Court of Australia in, in more than 100 years. Um, and that's a manifestation of the Eastern States bias of the legal profession. You went to, you attended Adelaide University, was that round about 1965? No, I, 65 was my last year at school. Uh, I started, started a dual degree in 1966. The dual degree Law, arts, law, economics, law, science became, has become the standard way of doing law in Australia. Although there have been some subsequent developments, more the American style of doing a first an undergraduate degree in something else and then a, a law degree sometimes in two years. Um, but I was at the beginning of a phase in which the standard way of doing law was to do a combined degree. It hadn't been properly organised at that stage and it took me six years rather than five. But I never regretted it. I studied history, English and international relations as part of my arts degree in law, concurrently law. So my first law subjects were in 1966 and I studied at Adelaide until 1971 when I graduated with the two degrees. Any friends or particular mentors from that period? Well, lots of friends. And as was common, one didn't really keep friends from school. Although one of one of my best friends I was at school with as well, and uh, subsequently went to university. He was a good cricketer. The person I referred to as having been barristed in for Vietnam and then held to be unfit. And we used to play cricket a lot together and talk a lot and share notes and things like that. And, in terms of mentors, I was influ influenced a lot by teachers. Um, Horst Looker, our contract teacher, who was really the best teacher I had. And John Keeler, who was a young Englishman, who's still a good friend, um, who taught law of torts and trusts. Um, Dan O'Connell, to an extent, although I was never close to O'Connell, he was very much in favour of the Vietnam War, I was very much against the Vietnam War, and that was a point of disagreement. And he, he was aware of that. And David Kelly, who was a subsequent professor on conflicts of laws. So the, 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 it was a good teaching staff. It was a small law school, 150 students a year <coughs> in the four-year LLV, three and a half years because the fourth year was spent in, in doing art, beginning articles, something I never did, um, with about 30 members of staff it had grown rather rapidly from 
a much smaller law school 10 years before and a law school dominated by professional teachers, we still had members of the practitioners and judges coming in to teach subjects normally very badly, though there were exceptions. Um, but it was turning into a professional law school with full-time academics doing the teaching. And I was one of the first cohorts to benefit from that situation. Uh, one of the Cambridge academics who was there during your undergraduate days was David Williams, briefly. Do you remember him? I remember his lectures. He became a good friend. Um, the academic who influenced me most, who was a visitor, was John Finnis, a um, subsequent professor of jurisprudence at Oxford. He was uh, an Adelaide graduate himself, wrote, wrote a doctorate. Um, in jurisprudence in Oxford and stayed in Oxford. Um, but he came to Adelaide in 1971 uh, um, as, a year, as a visitor for a year and supervised my honours dissertation in jurisprudence. Um, and he was a significant influence at the time. The next date that I have from your CV is your arrival in 1972 at Oxford and I wondered what prompted you to make this move. Well, I, um, I wasn't interested in local legal practice as I've explained and I thought I, I very much wanted to travel and study abroad and the tradition in uh, Adelaide was the, the best students went to Oxford, not so much Cambridge, and the links with Oxford and John Keeler and Arthur Rogerson and other teachers at the law school were from Oxford. And the Rhodes Scholarship was specifically to study at Oxford. I, I didn't get the I wasn't eligible for the Rhodes because I married in my final year of um, law. And in those days, if you married, you couldn't get the Rhodes Scholarship. So I got a a shell scholarship, uh, which would have enabled me to s choose where I studied, but um, I decided to get to Oxford. John Finnis was an influence there. Uh, and Dan O'Connell also, because um, Dan had just been appointed to the Chichley Chair, uh, elected to the Chichley Chair in 1971. And he went to Oxford, uh, he went to Oxford at the same time as I did. And he suggested that I might write a doctorate with him on a subject of 18th century legal history to do with transfer of territory and early manifestations of ideas of self-determination and nationalism and so on. Um, I wasn't interested in a purely historical thesis and I wasn't interested, despite the work with John Finnis in a in a, as being a theorist, um, I, I've always had an interest in legal theory, but I never wanted to be a pure theorist. Um, international law appealed to me as something which uh, was the other. It was a, ref a legal reflection of the rest of the world, and I hadn't seen very much of the rest of the world and wanted to do so. So Oxford and international law thesis were the what I settled on. Um, the other significant international lawyer at Oxford at the time was Ian Brownlee, whose book I used, uh, the first edition of Principles, came out in 1964. I studied international law in 1967 and used the first edition of Principles. Um, O'Connell was very unhappy to see me carrying it around. Uh, I didn't carry around O'Connell's two volume work on international law largely because it was too heavy, I had it. Um, but O'Connell would have preferred I used his book rather than Brownlee's book. In fact, I used them both. Um, and Brownlee was m much more in line with my general thinking about international relations at the time. Uh, O'Connell was rather conservative and pro-liberal pro party, which I was more Labour Party. I never joined a political party. I came from a pro-Labour background. 
and, and Brownlee, who had been a member of the Communist Party, was small L liberal and slash radical. And I unfortunately ended up as, you know, I didn't have, I didn't exercise a conscious choice, but I did, I think, express a view which may have been taken into account that I wanted to work with Brownlee, and that was what was decided. I wondered about that. Yeah. So I turned up at Keeble, uh, no, uh, yes, Keeble College. No, uh, Wadham College, which is where Brownlee was a fellow. He had been passed over for O'Connell for the Chichley chair. Um, he, ne he never held that against me. He, 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 I, I made it clear from an early stage that I wasn't an O'Connell acolyte. Um, he suggests I work in the law of the sea, and I just wasn't particularly interested in doing that. I was interested in statehood uh, at the political end of the spectrum of international law subjects. And I remember reading Robert Jennings' um, Acquisition of Territory and International Law, and also the first edition of Brownlee. Both of them said that the literature on statehood was, you know, the international law literature on statehood was, was sparse. That gave me a clue of writing a book on statehood. Um, I said to Brown, I wanted to write a book on the creation of states, the acquisition of statehood. And he rather bridled at that. He said, that's a very big subject. I said, he wouldn't allow one of my later doctoral students to write on such a big subject. But I persuaded him that uh, that's what I wanted to do. And he went along with that after I'd written an introductory paper on the subject. So I spent, I was in Oxford for about two and a half years. Um, I didn't finish the doctorate there, partly because my then wife and I had a, our first daughter, Rebecca, who was born actually before I started the doctorate in 1972. We married in 71. Um, and we didn't, we were obviously a young married couple. We didn't, I didn't make many new friends in Oxford as a married couple with a child who was ten, ten to take over to be a priority. And eventually we decided to go back to Australia, to Australia and to Adelaide where my wife's parents were who were going to be very helpful looking after the child. We subsequently had our second daughter, Emily, who's now an associate professor in international law at the University of Sydney. Rebecca is a journalist and commentator and author and a diverse career and I'm proud of them both. So we went back to Adelaide and I finished the doctorate in the first year or, year or so of you know, being in Adelaide in 1974, 1975. I finished the doctorate beginning in 1976 and was examined on it later in 1976. There was a problem in that the thesis was too long. It was about 1,200 pages. That was a time when there, was no, there were no length limits on PhDs. And in fact, I believe it's true that Oxford introduced the length limit on PhDs after I submitted. Uh, well, I think 1,200 is an exaggeration. It was about 800 pages. But it was way, it was 165,000 words, and the 100,000 word limit, which has become standard for um, UK doctorates, was introduced to Oxford because I had grossly gone over the top. <laughs> and I remember the chair of the Oxford faculty wrote to me and said the thesis was too long to examine. And I suggested that they examine the first two parts of it, which were 100,000 words taking into account the existence of the other two parts. And they agreed to do that. It was examined by Morris Mendelssohn and James Fawcett. They gave me a very nice liner. And eventually, of course, published. But it was written between the hours of five o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning in Adelaide because I had two, two children by that stage. And yes. the rest of the day was teaching and examining and uh, researching, but the actual writing was done when everyone else was asleep. <laughs>
that gave me the habit of working early in the morning, which I've only stopped doing recently. So when you returned to Adelaide, having been sort of part of the collegiate system in Oxford, although for a short period, and as you pointed out, having a family, so you could not have been thoroughly immersed in it, presumably, but nevertheless, did you slightly miss it, sort of? Not particularly. I, uh, I did all my work from the law library, um, the Bondian Law Library, and I had a place on the ground floor of the law library where I worked. And I didn't have much to do with the college. Um, I became more acclimatised to the collegiate system when I went to Cambridge. Um, and while you were at Oxford, was there any sense at all of the tremendous changes that were afoot with the entry into the common market? It was still very preliminary. Um, British entry into the common market was the early 70s, wasn't it? Um, so it hadn't happened at that stage. Um, I followed British politics closely. I remember the electorates, uh, the, the elections of 1960. Eight. Um, it took a long time for the common market waters to flow up the rivers, as Lord Denning put it in one case. Um, so it was a very gradual process. It's now a rather chaotic process of withdrawal, which is a great pity. Did you fit in a visit to Cambridge during that time? Or uh, yes, I went, at, I went to Cambridge once. And on the invitation of Robert Jennings to give a talk to the International Law Club <clears throat> on, I think it was on the International Law and English Law. Um, I'd just been asked by Ian Brownlee to take over from him as the writing the case notes on British cases on international law for the British Yearbook, Ian being one of the editors of the yearbook, um, with, with Robbie. And I remember taking the train to Cambridge and giving a, I think, not very good talk to the students. But I didn't have much to do with Cambridge, um, except for a cricket match between Oxford and Cambridge Australians. Um, I was a medium fast bowler, not a very good one, but I, I enjoyed cricket and I played cricket for my colleagues. It was the one collegiate activity that engaged in. So you returned to Adelaide uh, to a lectureship from yes. 74 to 76 and this was presumably part of your overall plan that you had intended returning? I, I thought very hard about returning to Adelaide. I felt like I was, was a, something of a, a defeat is putting it too strongly, but going back to where I'd come from and having wanted to get out into the world. Um, in retrospect, it was a good thing, it was a good decision because it enabled me to finish the thesis under good conditions. Um, with, with The library was well stocked as a result of O'Connell's work on it. And uh, the, the librarians were very sympathetic with my needs. Um, and it was, it was a friendly place and it was, it was a good law school. It subsequently went through a difficult period, or it's come out of that more recently. Um, but at the time, it was a good place to teach, a good place to be. Uh, but it was still Adelaide, and it was still remote from other parts of Australia. Um, and so there, there were concerns that I might feel as we get locked up in my hometown. But that didn't happen because uh, in 1982, I was, late 1981, I was approached to become a member of the Australian Law Reform Commission, which is based in Sydney, and that was the first breakthrough into what might be described as public affairs. And Michael Kirby, essentially a High Court judge, was the president of the Australian Law Reform Commission, was very active and dynamic. And I was asked to go to work on the recognition of Aboriginal customary laws. 
as the main subject. Um, that was being handled by the Commission, but not well handled and taken a long time, and no one really knew what was drifting as a topic. Um, when in Adelaide I taught constitutional law as well as international law, I was a public, general public lawyer, although international law was my main interest, it wasn't my only interest. And I wrote about constitutional law and published a book on the Australian court system and things like that. When you were a senior lecturer, lecturer your two books, Creation of States and Australian Courts of Law, but just before we come to that, it was during the about 1975-77 that Elie Lauterpacht was in Australia advising the Foreign Affairs Department. I wondered whether you at any point met him. Yes, I'd met him in England briefly. And, and he, one of, the, one of the things he did was to inaugurate a, a, an annual meeting of people from the government ministries in Canberra and academic international lawyers. I attended those meetings in 1975 and 1977, paid for by the Commonwealth in the first instance because the Whitlam government was more, more open to that sort of thing than the Australian governments were subsequently. And that created links with the younger members of the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Attorney General's Department, which have survived over that generation. And I grew up together and I've had, had quite a lot to do with them later on. So Ellie, that was one of Ellie's initiatives. I didn't have anything to do with him professionally at that stage. Um, but I did, I, did, I did observe his performances when he was advisor. And I've written about that since in an article which is on the web and which is being published in the Australian New Book for International Law. On the latter part. So on the latter part tradition, it, it's really about Ellie, but the first half was about his time in Australia. Well, you were a senior lecturer from 1977 to 1981. What were the circumstances of the promotion? I was promoted because of the Ox Oxford Doctorate. And you, as you mentioned, spent the first part of this of that year formatting, reformatting it. And yes, because the uh, OUP said it was too long. <laughs> Just like Oxford had said it was too long. And they wanted it cut down. And I, I cut it down, to my regret. I subsequently put back a lot of that material in the second edition. It was one of the reasons for the second edition. Very interesting. Um, for example, I, in, order, in an attempt to get it down to the limit set by the press, I left out the discussion of Israel which was 20 or so pages of the original manuscript. And you, you, that was a mistake. You couldn't really talk about the creation of states without talking about the creation of Israel. And um, I put that back uh, in a more, more elaborated form as well as a good deal of other material because of what had happened since. Uh, that was published in 2006 as an enlarged second edition. And you gained the American Society of International Law Certificate of Merit for your book. Yes, in, I think in 1991. That was very nice. It gave me a degree of faith in my capacity to do international law, even remotely, so to speak. From at Adelaide. that early stage, yes. yes. And at the same time, you passed your bar qualifications to the Australian High Court. Well, it was only High Court. I was. Ne I never did uh, articles in those days. If you want to be fully qualified as a barrister solicitor, you had to spend a year and a half uh, in a form of apprenticeship. I never made time for that, and I only remedied that situation, um, really, by way of gaining exemptions from bar requirements when I went to England and joined Matrix Chambers, and they arranged for me to qualify fully for the English bar, um, which is something I never did, never managed to do in Australia. The High Court qualification was by examination, and so sort of second class admission really. 
your book, Australian Courts of Law, which was published during this period, has gone to a fourth edition in 2003, so it was a very good seller, and it was published with and written with Brian Oakskin. I personally, that was the fourth edition. The first three editions I did by myself. Oh, I see. Right. And I did the fourth edition with Brian Opeskin. Right. After I moved to, to England, I mean, was, he was a younger public lawyer, a colleague of mine. And I needed some help with that. And it was, in a way, it was an acknowledgement of my desire to be a practitioner, and to write about courts if, if I couldn't practice in them. And because my, the first part of my legal career I wasn't doing much practice. There wasn't really a call for academics to practice in those days, unless you'd already established yourself. And I, I started to practice a bit when I moved to Sydney. It was very difficult to do it from Adelaide. You became a reader at Adelaide in 1982, yeah. and I wondered to what you owed this promotion. Um, just publications and performance and so on. It was a fairly rapid promotion. I became a professor in the next year in 1983, so it took nine years from lecturer to professor. Um, yes, you're doing your Times Reader, you were appointed to the Australian Law Reform Commission. Yeah, I was appointed well, I was a senior lecturer and became a reader and currently with my move to Sydney. I worked in the Australian Law Reform Commission on, as I said, on Aboriginal Customary Laws, which was still one of the biggest projects I've ever done. It was a two-volume report. And I understand it's that all of the reports now, in the uh, numbering must be 100 or so, of the Australian Law Reform Commission, it's the one which has been most referred to uh, by scholars and most cited. And it was a very difficult project. And I, it was one of those projects where I really needed to do it twice, once to learn how to do it, and the second time to do it properly. Um, but that didn't happen. I also worked on foreign state immunity, um, a reference given by the Attorney General's Department because I was there and I had done work on foreign state immunity. And that became the Foreign States Immunities Act of 1985 of uh, the Federal Parliament, which of course is still in force and is I think one of the better conceived of the common law state immunity acts. I also worked on admiralty jurisdiction, giving rise to the Admiralty Act of 1988, which is still the foundation for admiralty jurisdiction of the federal court in Australia. As well as Aboriginal customary law that you worked on during this period. Yeah, yes. And these must have all contributed to your promotion to a chair. Well, most of the, the reports came out after I'd been promoted to a chair. Um, I was offered a chair at Sydney in 1983, but at the same time, Adelaide promoted me to a professor, and I had promised my then wife that if I had the choice between Adelaide and Sydney, we'd go back to Adelaide where her parents were. And subsequently she realised that she got used to Sydney and was happy when I was offered the challenge chair in 1986, 87, I can't remember. Um, so we, we went back to Adelaide for a couple of years, but I then moved definitively to Sydney. She still lives in Sydney with our, with our two children. Your promotion to the chalice chair, uh, in 86 yes. occurred when you were merely, you were only 38 years old yes. and um, this, any circumstances that you can tell us about this promotion? Well the chair became vacant because DHN Johnson, David Johnson, who had been professor at London School of Economics, had gone to Australia to the chalice chair when Julia Stone, who was Chalice Professor of International Law and Jurisprudence combined the two fields, retired. Julius Stone was a very, very significant international law figure of his generation. Um, David Johnson held the chair for about 10 years, 
and then you retired and it was offered to me uh, and by that stage it was, it was clear I wanted to be in Sydney and so I was happy to accept it and my family wanted to be in Sydney as well so they were happy to come. And it was during this time that you published another book, The Rights of Peoples, and this has ever since fed into your interest in human rights. This was published as the rights of peoples, <coughs> peoples or governments, and you also worked on the Law Reform Commission under the Aboriginal Customary Law section. Yes, uh, speaking about the Law Reform Commission, um, rights of peoples was, was some work I'd done for the Australian National Commission for UNESCO, which was then working on rights of peoples. And it, it was an edited book; it wasn't a monograph. Um, I, f I found difficulty in that period, partly because of the work from the Law Reform Commission. I wrote four reports for the Law Reform Commission, which were in effect monographs, but collective work. I found it difficult to produce another, a, a second monograph. And, and in fact, that I had various plans to produce book on state immunity, for example, and never did so, partly because of the various demands. I was on the Australian Law Reform Commission throughout the 80s and then moved to, to Cambridge. Right. And the various demands of Cambridge took over. I wasn't able to get back to monograph writing in right. 15 years. So you, a symposium was held where your Professor, your first part, Professor Brownlee, gave a paper. Yes. And it was chapter one of the book. You gathered up the threads in the final essay, concluding that the right to development is a right of peoples. Do you still hold these views, Judge Crawford? I, I was very sceptical about the right to development. But what I insisted was that we get it clear, if we're talking about, that there, there, there are rights of peoples in the national law most obviously the right to self-determination. Um, but a lot of the things that were put forward as rights to peoples were really individual rights exercised in conjunction with others. Minority rights are an example of that. Um, at the time, and even I think now, we don't attribute rights to minorities as such. We attribute rights to members of minorities to do things in conjunction with other members of the minority. And so a lot of the discussion about rights of peoples was very woolly, lacking in rigour, and I was really attempting to introduce some rigour to it. Right. Um, a significant aspect of your time at Sydney was that it was during this time that your association with the International Court of Justice began. Your first case, 1989 to 92, the certain phosphate lands in the Narrow case, which was settled in 1993. Um, I noticed that Brownlee was also counsel for. Narrow. Yes, he was counsel because I suggested that he be counsel. Ah, Narrow, the Narrow, Narrow government came to me in the late 80s and asked if I would advise them about their rehabilitation claim in relation to the phosphate lands and in mind by the British Phosphate Commissioners under the trusteeship for Nauru, which is a trusteeship between Australia, New Zealand and United Kingdom, exercised on their joint behalf, largely by Australia. So I was counsel against Australia. And I advised Nauru to accede to the optional clause of the statute of the court and eventually to bring proceedings, having waited for the necessary year. And against Australia alone because there was probably no jurisdiction in relation to New Zealand and the United Kingdom. And Nauru did that and that case was fought at the preliminary objection stage in late 1991. And my first appearance before any court, and the first time I stood up in a court was in this court, uh, and decided in 1992 in favour of Australia, uh, in favour of Nauru. Um, and then, as you say, settled. So 
at the same time, the Australian government wasn't particularly enthusiastic about my being counsel for Nauru, but they were reminded by, amongst others, the Chief Justice of Australia, Sir Anthony Mason, that the cab rank rule in the Australia, Australian bar meant that I was entitled to take any brief that came to me, and indeed probably obliged to take it. Um, subsequently, with the consent of the government of Nauru, I was counsel for Australia in the East Timor case, which was being fought, which just started at that time. So my first two cases, one for Australia and one against Australia. Right. Um, that and was the beginning of my international law practice. Two other cases during that period, the Iran-USA, where you were counsel for Iran, and the Libya-Chad, where you were counsel for Libya. And they, they both started, and indeed, my third case before the court, which is still one of the formative cases, was Gapchiova Najamaros, where I was counsel for Hungary. That was the first time I led a team in the International Court. Very big case. A very important case in the relation to the law of rivers. Um, and those, those briefs all came to me after I moved to Cambridge, and my practice developed from there. You brought those three cases to Cambridge? No, I brought the two Australian cases, East Timor and Nauru. But Nauru was by then decided. East Timor was ongoing, and then I, when I was in Cambridge, I was retained by Hungary and Iran and other states in a range of cases. Right. Libya, Chad. Later on, Nigeria, Cameroon. It was the narrow case that really unlocked the beginning of your. Yes, well, you've got, you've got a. Yeah, young international lawyers often say to me, how do you get to appear before the International Court of Justice? And my answer is, it's very simple, you just have to have done so before. <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a logical problem there. Uh, you, people get chances. Uh, the chance is largely luck. Um, or someone asks you to do something which you perhaps didn't expect. And then you have to take your chances when they come. And I was basically 40 by that stage, so my practicing career was really the second part of my life. A major milestone at that point was your appointment to the Ewell Chair yes. at Cambridge. And I wondered if you could tell us about the circumstances of that. Well, uh, Derek Bauer, after a tenure, tenure of the Chair from 82 to 91, retired. I think he retired slightly early because he, he had some health problems with his back. Um, and so the chair became vacant. And I had to be applied for and got it. It was an elective process, there was no interview. And I don't know much about the circumstances of the election. I do know there was a controversy because Ellie Latapak applied at the same time. He was one of the other applicants for the chair. and. The committee was, I understand, divided as between supporters of Ellie and supporters of me. And I got it, I say this, in Ellie was a, a real a strong character and a very nice man and he, he never held it against me. He, he told me at the time that he'd hoped to get the chair because it was his father's chair. And one of the reasons for the fame of the chair is, of course, the tenure of Sir Hirschlader Pump. And Ellie said, that's the past, and we'll relate to each other as individuals, and we always did. And I appreciate that greatly. When I interviewed him in 2008, he said to me, you really must interview yourself. And... Uh, I was of a mind to do so in any case, but I share that with you. Um, Judge Crawford, the first two years of your time in at Cambridge were 93-94, when the faculty was still based in the old schools. Yes. Any memories of that particular accommodation? Accommodation is putting it strongly. It was uh, very cramped quarters. 
and John Tarley of blessed memory was instrumental in the design of the new building and the move to the new building which occurred later in the 90s, in 1996. I remember teaching in the old schools. The teaching room was rather nice and old fashioned, but the faculty accommodation had nothing to be said for it. And the, the Squire Law Library was at least grandly um, squeezed into the, what's now the Keys, is it Keys? Yes. At the library. Um, so I, I worked from college for the first few years and then when Elliot Halipak retired as director of the research centre, I moved to the research centre and spent the rest of my Cambridge life working from um, Cranmer Road. At this point, would you like to take a, a break? No, I'm fine. Um, do you have any... I mean, Kurt always described the old library, the Squire Library, as, as such a beautiful, wonderful building. Do you, do you agree with those It was sentences? a beautiful building. And Kurt's spirit still, I'm sure, <laughs> inherits this. I don't believe in ghosts, but... If, there were, if one was to believe in ghosts, it would be Kurt in relation to that building. I understand he, during the war, he was a fire warden on the roof of yeah. that building. That's right. And I'm sure he protects it in some sense, even now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, on your arrival, uh, Ellie was still the director of the Light Park Centre and remained so until 1995 and was followed by... John Dugard for two years. John and I were co-directors and I'd arranged, John had been elected to the, um, as a visiting professor, I'm sorry, the title, the title of visiting professor. Um, was he the, wasn't he a good heart? A good heart, yes, he was a good heart professor in 1995 and I arranged with John Tarley for him to stay on for an extra year, the fact that he provided money. And he, so he had a two-year tenure, and he, he and I were co-directors of the research centre during that period. And John is still one of my closest friends. He, when he works in the court as an ad hoc, he works from a neighbouring office oh. and lives quite close to where we live. So we've uh, had a strong relationship ever since. Yes. So uh, Ellie expressed the view that he wanted the Hill Professor to be associated with the Lada Park Centre, which hadn't been the case particularly with Derek. Derek was on the Learn Unit Committee but didn't have any other particular... I see. Um, the Lada Park Centre was very much a, a Lada Park initiative. Um, with other Cambridge International Law teachers not really in, involved, there was an exception to that Vaughan Lowe who was at the time a um, lecturer at Cambridge, did have an involvement with the centre. Uh, Chris Greenwood had an involvement with Ellie uh, in, in international law reports, but didn't work from the centre, even though the people who worked on the international law reports did work from the centre. So there was, I think it was fair to say that the Lava Park Centre in those days was semi-detached from the faculty. Right. Uh, and one of my mandates was to I I incorporate it in the faculty, not as a, not physically, because of its separate premises are uh, one of its great assets, and that's entirely due to every other part. But to, as well, um, from a scholastic point of view and from a point of view of the perception of members of the faculty and students, especially graduate students. I wanted to integrate the research centre in the faculty and I'm pleased to say that my successor as Hugh Professor A. Obama this year has continued that process, taking it further. That was one of your achievements. Um, can you say anything else about your role during that time? Well. I didn't. I, I didn't run research projects through the centre to any great degree, and that's perhaps a defect. Mark Weller, who was one of my successors, did 
much more in that regard than I did. One of the reasons was I was on the International Law Commission and that was taking me to Geneva for three months of the year. And uh, as a member of the International Law Commission, I was involved successively in the work on the International Criminal Court and on state responsibility. So I had two major projects for the ILC and they tended to get in the way of what might have been described as rather about centre research projects. I, uh, I was also very busy in practice and with graduate students and so on. At one stage I had 17 PhD students and other teaching, teaching commitments. So my research was very much focused on the ILC work during those years. The research centre was renamed the Lauterbach Centre in 95. What was the thinking behind this? Well, it was, it was obviously the Lauterbach Centre because it was associated with Ellie and with Hirsch. Not that, not that Hirsch had anything to do with the Lauterbach Centre because it was created well after his death, long after his death. But the Lauterbach tradition was identified with Cambridge and was a very distinguished tradition. Ellie wasn't very much in favour of calling the, the centre, he called it the Research Centre for International Law. Um, though most of the projects run from the Research Centre were Ellie's publishing projects associated with things like the Iran-US Claims Tribunal reports, the International Law reports, later on the ICSID reports. I remember that Ian Brownlee used to say that the, the, there was the Research Centre for International Law and there were individuals like Warren Lowe and Derek Bauer who engaged in research in international law. It was a slightly unkind remark, but there was some truth to it. It seemed to me that it was accurate and an appropriate recognition call it the Lauder Park Centre and the faculty agreed with me and that's how it's now identified. I, I spent some time in the article I wrote on Ellie justifying that decision. I'm sure it was right. Ellie wanted to sell the name to make money for the centre. And the faculty provided very little money for the centre. All the money had come from private sources including Ellie himself. Um, but you were director of the centre for two periods, 97 to 2003, and then from 2006 to 2009, there was a break. Um, was that because the break was because I was chair of the faculty chair board. Of the faculty board. And uh, Daniel Bethlehem took over as right. director until he was appointed legal advisor yes. to the British government. Yes. So I was. I was director of the centre from 96, in effect, to 2009, with that three-year gap. Yes. And I worked from the centre as an individual throughout that time. I remember when you were chairman of the faculty, is there any outstanding memory that springs to mind during that, your tenure as chairman? There seemed to be a lot, of, lot to do at the time, but I don't really remember. I think you, you instigated a, an assistant. I mean, deputy director. Or deputy director, yes. yes. Um, the tradition at Cambridge, which is still the tradition, and I think it's worked well because the Cambridge faculty is a very good one. It's that the professors collectively took responsibility for the running of the faculty. And the principal manifestation of that was the tenure as chair of the faculty board. And I was always a believer in taking, well, taking a collective responsibility for these things. So when Jack Beetson, who was my predecessor as chair of the faculty board, was appointed to the High Court, he asked if I would take over and I agreed to do it. And it, it brought me into the affairs of the faculty to a greater extent than before. Which was tied to your 
ultimate vision for the latter part of the centre to be brought closer. Yes, that's right. Yes. Also during your time as your professor, you arranged annual FCO courses in the faculty. That was something which, which already existed, but it was, Did it? Uh, I simply continued. Right. Just, uh, something earlier had, had arranged. Right. Um, you were called to the English Bar in 99 at Gray's Inn. Did you have any time to attend the functions? I was originally a goaltenant at Three Veron Buildings, but then I can't remember the exact year, it may have been the early 2000s, and a bit earlier than that, Matrix Chambers was founded. My, my work at the bar was very much associated with Philippe Sands, who we worked together. He worked as my junior in a number of cases, and he was deeply involved in the establishment of Matrix Chambers. The Matrix Chambers was unusual in that it tried to bring together academic and practitioners. Uh, academics were not door tenants, they were four members of chambers, paying half rates and obviously working less than full time, but still greatly involved in chambers and that was a very good system, which has continued. So I became a, member, a founding member of Matrix Chambers and a full member of the English Bar. I didn't do many English cases, nor I think did Derek Bound. The tradition is that the international cases were largely done by professors in Oxford and Cambridge, and the domestic cases were done by professors in London. Rose Higgins did, did some international cases, but quite a lot more domestic cases. Derek Bart didn't do very many domestic cases. Ellie did quite a lot of both. In uh, 2003, you became a member of the Curatorium of the Hague Academy of International Law. Can you outline what this entailed? Well, basically selecting lecturers and helping run the programs. Right. And I was a member of the Curatorium for quite some time, as long as it was possible for individuals to be members, I think. Fifteen years, something like that. And during that time, the Hague Academy went from strength to strength. It's now got very, very fine premises just within eyesight of where we're sitting. Very good lecture theatre and programmes both in the Hague and elsewhere, run by a succession of very able Secretary Generals. Um. While you were in your your at the your chair, did you, did you have any overseas sabbaticals? I never, never had an overseas sabbatical. I had one actually actually in Cambridge when I was still in Adelaide. Um, but I, I did have a non-study period, sorry, a non-teaching period, I should say. But it was interrupted by the need. Uh, it was after I'd been chair of the faculty board. I was granted a year's leave. But during that period, Daniel Bethany went to the far office. So I had to come back to, I had to cut my, my leave short and come back to the Battle Park Centre. Right. But I didn't really have any study leave during the whole of my period in Cambridge. Did you know Daniel Bethany? I was responsible for his appointment right. as a lecturer. I thought it was very good, yes. and we, we got on extremely well. Yeah. I, I still remember when he was, the moment he was told he had been appointed legal advisor, and how pleased he was, mm -hmm. as, as I was. Yes. Um, so you had a long association, as we know, with the United Nations, and it was during your, your tenure that you were a member of the International Law Commission from 92 to 2001, a special rapporteur on the state responsibility from 97 to 2001. Could you tell us how this came about? It was a lot of things happening in international law by accident. This was an accident. But the first, the first reading and the first draft on articles on state responsibility had been worked out by a series of Italian special rapporteurs, 
Well, I said a series of Italian special rapporteurs is not quite accurate. Ro Roberto Argo was special rapporteur on state responsibility from the 60s until the late 80s when he was elected to the court. Um, he was replaced by Rip Hagen, a Dutch lawyer, for a short period of time. And then by Gaetano Italian, uh, Aranjo Ruiz, an Italian professor, who, whose period on the commission came to an end in 1966, no, sorry, 1996, against his wishes. That meant that in 1997, there was a vacancy in the special. Uh, Aranjo Ruiz finished the first reading on state responsibility in 1996. And it was a major part of the work of the Commission during my first term. So the question was who was going to take over in 1997. And I put in a bid for it. The state responsibility was one of the classic topics of international law and one of the great unfulfilled tasks of the Commission. And the plenary accepted that idea. I was appointed in 1987 as Special Rapporteur and given four years to complete the second reading, which we did. I still think it's my greatest single achievement as an international lawyer was to finish the articles on responsibility and the associated work, commentaries, the books and so on. I hope that we can return to that when we speak about your scholarly work tomorrow. Yes, of course. Um, but before we close the section on your, your tenure, um, Deb Wills has always said that you were very supportive of the Squire Library. I wonder if you could just comment upon that. Any particular contributions to the development of library collections or anything that you recall? When I came to Cambridge, the library was in a fairly bad way, it had a very low budget. And John Tiley was very concerned about that, as he was concerned about many things associated with the faculty in the early 90s. And I became chair of the faculty, of the press syndicate, of the, sorry, of the library syndicate, and pushed for an increase in budget, which happened, but still not magnificent doesn't compare with most, most North American libraries. It's better than it was. And of course, the, the library moved to its current premises where it has at least a modicum of space. I was very supportive of the library and still am. It's obviously central to research and scholarship in law, including international law. And I, I was never in favour of the Lana Park Centre having its own library for resource reasons is much more sensible to have an integrated collection with professional librarians. Yes. And that's what we've got. Yes. With, you, with yourself as <laughs> an important part of that. Thank you. Well, um, I propose the Lana Park Centre, which we are very pleased to support as a library service, but um, how would you summarise the current influence of the centre on a global scale? Well, while I was there, it had two main strands. Um, its publication programme, which I supported, but didn't really extend. My main extension to publication was the development of the International Law Publishing at Cambridge University Press, in particular the series Cambridge Studies in International Comparative Law, which I restarted. It had declined. And it, was a pro it was a series started by Lord McNair, who was a sixth year professor, and taken over by Hirsch Lampard. Robert Jennings became editor of the series but didn't really do anything very much to it. So it was it was more or less in decline when, when I came. I remember on arrival at Cambridge I rang 
Cambridge University Press and said, I want to speak to the person responsible for law. And the secretary who answered the, the receptionist who answered the phone said, oh, we don't do law. And that was a fairly remarkable proposition for a university press. And I, with, again, with John Tiley's help, I contacted senior people at the university press and Coincidentally, Ellie was at the time selling Grocious Publishing to Cambridge University Press. The Cambridge University Press took over international law publishing in a serious way. And as part of that, we revived the series Cambridge Studies in International Branch of Law, which has now got more than 100 volumes in it. And it's probably the most significant monograph series in international law of any publisher. That wasn't a, a Lalapak Centre venture, although I did all the work from the Lalapak Centre. The second aspect of the Lalapak Centre was the um, the visiting program, and over the years the centre has had many hundreds of visitors. I think Anita who were recruited as administrative officer of the centre, puts in about 700. So a huge number of people have come to the centre and worked there and had it as their home, and it's, it's a very pleasant and collegial environment from that point of view. What I didn't do and what I perhaps regret is run, program, run independent research programmes from the centre. I think that's now happening largely as a result of the initiative with Mark Weller. And the uh, Alberta University has continued that. So I think that's the third strand which was missing in my time. So how would you sum up your illustrious academic career at Cambridge in the old chair? The thing I'm proudest of are the doctoral students. I had about 60 doctoral students at Cambridge, many of whom published their theses either through Cambridge or Oxford or other publishers. They, they included, although Christine Schenken was a doctoral student of mine in Sydney, where she was then teaching, but they included Susan Marks, Michael Byers, and many subsequent figures, and Karen Knopp, as a visitor, and very many others, and many of those books have been published and they've made a contribution to international legal study. Yes. So that's, I think, the most important thing that I did, the thing which has probably got the longest shelf life. I think others will have to say what other contributions I made to the centre. I think the centre became a a, a bigger outfit with more people around and a place where people could talk and discuss and have seminars and so on. We, we ran conferences on various subjects and as part of the spectrum of international law places. When in, in Europe the only place that might have a greater fame would be the Max Planck Centre in Heidelberg. But when you consider the resources of the Max Planck Centre in Heidelberg, probably 30 or 40 times the resources, the annual income of the Lada Park Centre, it's achieved a lot with very little. A very Cambridge way of doing things. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, We've previously touched on the beginning of your ICJ casework while you were in Sydney, but as a major factor in your career, international litigation really took off during your time at Cambridge. Yes. And in his assessment in your fish graph, Philippe Sands sums up your activities as ranging from Hamburg, Washington, Paris, Istanbul, and your second home here, The Hague. So I realise you can't speak about specific cases, but perhaps we can just ask you about some generalities. 
and I've trotted up some statistics from your CV on the ICJ website and come up with the following numbers. You were counselling ICJ cases 29 times, counselling international arbitrations 23, counselling arbitrations approximately 40, judge or arbitrator in OECD administrative tribunals 30 times, expert witness and published opinions 12. Much of this was undertaken while you were at Cambridge, where at the same time you had your normal academic and administrative duties, as well as writing your books and your papers. And this is nothing short of an heroic workload. Can you, can you tell us how you managed your time? Well, I used to work really hard, harder than I work now because I'm nearly 70 and the court has its own pace of work. We can talk about that probably later on. But I still, I still write quite a lot. But it was, it was what I was born to do. Yeah. It's what I wanted to do. And having, having the opportunity to represent governments was incredibly exciting. And so I, I just worked very hard at doing it probably to the detriment of other activities um, and social life, but that's the way it is. I was a typical um, middle-class workaholic. <laughs> so, as for the cases and the arbitrations themselves, I wonder if you could mention any highlights in this really remarkable professional career. The Gebchikov and Ajmarash case for Hungary was my first lead in the court and it was very important in my formation as an international lawyer. It gave rise to um, the experience of working with um, technical experts on environmental and scientific matters, which is something I loved doing and continue to do in the whaling case, for example, for Australia against Japan in the two Indus Waters arbitrations for Pakistan against India and in a number of other cases. And in, in several of the Costa Rican cases against Nicaragua, in one of the Colombian cases against Ecuador. So I, that's something I greatly enjoyed and working with experts in other fields, geomorphology, water, sediment transport, things like that. And generally in environmental science, sciences, fishery science. That was a great experience. But the cases don't fall into any particular category, they are across the field of international law, boundary cases, some advisory opinions, cases to do with international organisations. Um, I was expert in the Canadian Supreme Court in the Quebec reference, and that was a significant influence, and it's given rise to a very important judgement of the Canadian Supreme Court, fundamental in, in its significance which then fed back into the Kosovo Advisory Opinion where I was counsel for the United Kingdom with Daniel Bethlehem. And also the work I did for, in relation to Scottish, uh, the Scottish independence referendum. So there were strands following through in the various cases I did, but it's largely happenstance, whatever happens next, whatever comes in the door. I did a lot of work in investment arbitration, both as counsel and as arbitrator, and I'm continuing to act as arbitrator in a number of investment cases. And I contributed to the modern formation of the field of investment arbitration, which is a contentious area, but nonetheless, I think was important, and still is important. That's fascinating, thank you. Um, this brings us to your awards and honours. Are there any that you regard as particularly significant? Well, I've been, I've been 
had a series of honorary doctorates from various universities, um, so Paris, Amsterdam, and Neuchâtel, Peter Pazmani University in Budapest, Adelaide, I'm pleased to say. Um, so that, that, that those awards are recognition for work done. The Hudson Medal was probably a highlight of the American Society of International Law, which is awarded to a non-American for contributions to international law. I think Elliot Latifact got it. So there have been a series of honours like that. But, and then overall the highlight was the Companion of the Order of Australia in 1913, sorry, 2013, which is the highest Australian honour and, and partly awarded as part of the Australian campaign to run me for the court, but partly awarded for work I'd done up to then. Was there an occasion that you attended for that? There was a, uh, an event at Government House where the Governor General awarded, uh, made the award. It's been a wonderful occasion. My family were there, which is nice. <laughs> and my natal family, my brothers yeah. and sisters. It brings us to your United Nations roles and to quote from your original faculty, from the Cambridge faculty website entry, you were the first Australian member of the United Nations International Law Commission, 92 to 2001, and in that capacity responsible for the RLC's work on the International Criminal Court and for the second reading of the Articles of State Responsibility. We have touched on this in this interview, but is there anything more you could perhaps add to it? I very much enjoyed the time on the Commission. It was collective work, and a number of the judges on the court now, Judge Gaia, Judge Benuna, Others were members of the Commission in my time, Judge Robinson. I worked with them on these projects. Um, you had to exercise quite a lot of individual initiative. The Commission provided general background support, but didn't provide research support on particular projects, at least not at that time. So I had to use my own researches. And one of the answers to your previous questions, how did I do all of this? I did it with a great deal of help from research support. I've had about 30 researchers over this time, mostly very high quality, um, former students of mine at the LLM or PhD level. And I had various levels of support in the RLC work as well. So it, it wasn't all individual effort. brings us to your retirement from academia and your entry to the International Court of Justice. On your retirement, Professors Christine Chenkin and Freya Vartans organised a commemorative volume of essays to honour your 41 years of service to academic scholarship in international law. All 23 essays were written by 26 essays who were the Doctoral students. Yes, I, I made it clear I didn't want a normal first shift. Um, it's not. A, it's not a first shift. It's a, um, a book produced by my doctoral students. Right. With the exception of Philippe Sands and Ivan Shearer, who were colleagues of mine, who wrote biographical elements to which you referred. Right. But the rest were all doctoral students, including Christine Chinkin, who was the first, right. and Freya Bartons, who was a later doctoral student whom, much later still, I married. <laughs> She's now a professor at Oslo. At Oslo. Yes. We mm. just had our second daughter, a second child, a daughter. How wonderful. Well, the volume was published by CUP, Sovereignty, Statehood and State Responsibility. These are the areas that have been at the very heart of your international yes. work. Yes, yes. Uh, could you say anything more about the circumstances of the publication? Well, that was something that the, the, the editors offered, which I was very really grateful to receive. I didn't want a normal first shift. Yeah. Um, 
the, the, the Liber Amicorum, as they call them, the Book of Friends, uh, it's a good way of making enemies out of your friends because the, the, it's a terrible chore to write these things. And in the ordinary course of events, a lot of festschrifts never get read by anyone. And they're poorly indexed. Um, they're poorly, uh, I suppose they're in the various legal digests, but it's difficult to find them and they tend to get lost. But this was a proper book put together on a theme by Cambridge University Press and has therefore had decent circulation. And it was a very nice gesture as well. Two of the contributions were tributes to early life. Professor Ivan Shearer, currently Emeritus Professor at Sydney, <laughs> and then your time in England by Professor Sands. And I wonder if we could just go back to these, because they raise some very interesting details. <coughs> Professor Shearer says that apropos your time at Brighton High School, this is coming back to your school days, you were very fond of music and also public speaking and debating. So was this was this former uh, liking of yours what persuaded you to become to, to enter law? Public uh, debating and public speaking, yes. Music is something I really caught on to only later in my school career. My parents weren't musical. I never had a training in a musical instrument to my regret. But I became interested in music when I was at university and uh, got to know the classics and I still love music. But as a, very much as a passive listener, not as a performer, I regret to say. Professor Sharon also says that in addition to picking up the Angus Parson Prize in law in your final year, you were also a prize winner in literature, the Sir Archibald Strong Memorial Prize, and for English verse, the Bundy Prize. Are both these areas interests that you've retained? I'm still interested in poetry. I don't write poetry except on under intense emotional pressure, which you know, tends to happen less often these days. Um, but I used to write poetry to some extent, like thousands of people who lack the ability to be I mean, in my view, there's no such thing as moderately good poetry. There's either poetry or non-poetry. My work was very much in the non-poetry field. Um, but it's something I did and gained emotional satisfaction from doing. Do you think you could have become an English academic? No. Um, I never did an honours degree in, in the outside. Had I done so, it would have been more history than English in any event though I still read a great deal of English literature. But I was interested in public affairs from an early stage. And that's what, <coughs> why, amongst the legal, legal subdisciplines, I chose international law. Thank you. So if I'd had a, a career as a pure academic, it would have been as a historian rather than a, in literature. I'm, I'm still very much interested in the history of international law, for example. Yes. Yeah. There's also mention made by Ivan Shearer of the fact that you were the youngest member in modern times to be intellected to the Institute. Any circumstances of this event? Well, that was probably an accident. They heard about me and they didn't know who I was, so they elected me. There were no Australians in those days, and there's only two Australians now. Hillary Charlesworth is the second. And I think Ian Brownlee had something to do with the circumstances of the election. The Institute is a very peculiar body. It consists of ageing academics and some ageing judges who meet every two years in pleasant circumstances and pass resolutions which they alone read. I, I'm being slightly sardonic, but only slightly. Well, I think it was, a, it was a source of great um, disappointment to Kurt Epstein that it took him so long to be elected. Yes, he was someone who would have the, he would have contributed more, and the institute would have gained more had he been elected earlier. Uh, it's difficult if you come from countries like the UK with a lot of potential candidates. And right, and even now, very significantly, English academics have not been elected to the institute. Um, Vaughan Lowe, Christopher Greenwood, uh, Christopher Greenwood has now. Uh, after he became a judge, Philip Sands, 
So it's, very, it's membership is very patchy. Interesting. Um, something else that's mentioned by um, Ivan Shearer is that while you were in transit between Adelaide and taking up the chalice chair in Sydney, the bulk of the family possessions was destroyed by fire while they were in store. And obviously this must have been terribly traumatic. I wondered whether you lost any professional materials, 20 years of notes and papers and perhaps your legal library. Yes, I lost my legal library and had to re reconstitute. That was in 1982 when I was moving from Adelaide to the Law Reform Commission. It wasn't when I was later in the 80s. And it was, it was devastating, but mostly it was devastating because you, you build up a, an archive of objects which you acquire in flea markets and junk stalls and in the course of one's young life. And that was a, a, a photograph albums and things like that, and they were all eliminated. And I think that had an emotional impact, which we, my wife and I, uh, my then wife and I, didn't fully assimilate. So it was, a, it was a terrible thing. Yes. That was in 1982. But we survived. Yes. Finally, he notes that while you were dean at Sydney in 1992, you made international law a compulsory course. Would you say this had a long-term effect on the teaching of international law at Sydney? I think it's had an effect on the teaching of international law in Australia and that most uh, most Australian law schools now have international law, or at least a short course in international law as a compulsory course. And uh, that would have been regarded 20 or 30 years ago as unusual. In fact, I think Sydney was the first place to have it. We gave people an introduction both to public and private international law, which is a somewhat, somewhat unorthodox thing to do in itself, because they're, un they're only distantly related to each other. But it gave students some access to what's going on elsewhere, which as part of a modern legal education is absolutely indispensable. I, I only didn't do it in Cambridge because uh, most students did international law in any event, so the need for it was less. In this work, Philippe Sands mentions that he first met you in 1987 in Cairo mm. at a meeting of the Institute. And you were at Sydney and he was a student at St. Katz at the time and he was working at the Research Centre with Eddie. And I wondered if you recall that occasion. Of course. He, he was young and full of life. He's still young and full of life, even though he's not so young. <laughs> <laughs> One of the my closest friends in the, in the field of international law. Um, and he, he, he says that I was open to contact with younger people. I was young myself at the time. And I suppose that was true, and we've, we've maintained that link ever since. He mentioned um, the remarkable number of 57 PhD research students why at Cambridge? It's more than that, 63. 63, thank you. And I, I wondered how you, you managed to actually keep tabs on them. Well, PhD students mostly keep tabs on themselves. You, you've got to write to them every so often and say, how's it coming? But I, I gave the, the PhD students as much attention as they needed and more attention when crucial events were coming up like first year qualification or putting the thesis together. But I didn't insist on regular chapters. I don't, and I do my own PhD, but you, you don't study and then write. You write in order to study and study in order to write. The two activities happen together. Yeah. So I was always saying to people, what, what are you going to write next? Let me see it, let's talk about it. And if you, if you set, a, set a program of um, study of that sort. PhDs, uh, in effect, supervise themselves because they come along with the next. They don't come along to talk generally about what they've been reading. They come along with the text, which you can analyse and discuss. And that's that was always the way I supervised. Uh, and as I said, I think that's the most significant thing I did in my academic career. <laughs>
In earlier, Philippe Sands mentions that you gave an opinion on the Scottish independence in 2000. Well, well. That's right. And seeing the topicality of referenda these days, I wondered whether you could give us a little background to this opinion. Well, the, the question was whether Scotland, if it became independent, would be a new state or in some way continue the affiliation to the United Kingdom. And the answer to that was clear, it would be a new state. And that had the implication into Australia that it would have to reapply to membership of the European Union. It wouldn't inherit that automatically. That view was criticised by some European lawyers. But I think it was it was the position taken by the European Commission itself and this is the position taken by the European Commission in relation to other secession attempts within Europe. So there was that aspect of it. It was written for the British government and published as a command paper. And it says what it says. I can't comment on that. While on the subject of referenda, do you think that the Brexit result will have any effect on the UK's influence in the realm of international law and any reduction of its role on the Security Council? Well, it won't reduce the reduction of its role on the Security Council because the British government, the, the United Kingdom, has a veto on the amendment of the Charter. But it's one thing to have a veto, it's another thing to exercise it. And exercising it requires political will and to some extent depends on the legitimacy of what of the positions you're taking. The United Kingdom rarely exercises a veto solely on the Security Council. On the broader question whether it impacts on the United Kingdom standing in national law, the answer is obviously it does. That may be temporary. <coughs> it may be that the vision of the Brexiteers, and I'm not a Brexiteer, I, I obviously was not an elector in the United Kingdom and I don't express views on the United Kingdom domestic politics. But I, I think, in retrospect, it's a great pity that Brexit is happening. It's clear that it is happening. The vision of those who support it is that the United Kingdom will f find its own way in national relations and resume its former status. And I hope that's true, but uh, the, the jury is to that. In the meantime, it's had a very significant adverse effect on the United Kingdom standing in international law. I think that's clear. Finally, we come to your election as a judge in 2015. Could you describe the circumstances of this event? Well, Australia's last judge on the court, and the only other Australian ever elected to the court, was Sir Percy Spender. He was elected in 1957, served to 1966, and was president in his last three years. And cast a notorious casting vote in the Second South West Africa cases, which has been part of my academic endeavour to criticise. It was a disastrous decision. But he, he was, in some other respects, quite a good judge. His dissenting opinion in the Temple case is a very fine one, for example. He was Minister for External Affairs before being elected to the court. The Australian government in the 1980s decided that it, it ought, in principle, to develop a candidate for election to the court in the longer term. They approached me in the mid-80s to see whether I'd be interested. So it was very far-sighted. And the program, uh, one of the reasons they nominated me to the International Law Commission was preparatory to a possible court candidature. And that took quite a long time to happen, but it shows the need for planning for what a, Australia is not a small country, but in, it's a small country in the Western European group in terms of its influence. It's not Germany or France or the United Kingdom. And it required preparation to run the campaign for the court. It was very strongly supported by the Australian government over those years. On a general level, what is the overall impression of the role played by the ICJ in world political events? <laughs> 
Well, it's very variable, and it's less than it was, partly because the diversity of courts and tribunals is much greater than it used to be. The Royal Sea Tribunal, WTO, European Court of Human Rights, Court of Justice of the European Union. There's much more adjudication going on, but a much smaller proportion of it is with the court. On the other hand, the court has always had a relatively restricted case law. And the important thing that it does is to deal with the cases it gets in a considered and careful way. That has to, I think it still does. One of the things that's impressed me on my period on the court now, over three years, is the care which goes into the preparation of judgments. Um, and although the court has been criticised for being slow, to some extent the speed at which things are done depends on the parties rather than the court. The court only has limited control over that. What it can control is the quality of the output, and the quality of the output is high. So you've been on the court for three years. <coughs> can you pick out any highlights so far? Well, one of my problems on the court, I'm afraid it's public knowledge, is that I've been conflicted in about 40% of the cases because I was counselling those cases before being elected. We knew that was going to happen. It's been worse than I thought it would be because a number of cases have come back to the court with which I had no earlier involvement. For example, a Chagos advisory opinion where I was counselling Russia's in the arbitration against the United Kingdom. So my role on the court has been more limited than it should have been, or might have been. But that is passing, and the cases, the new cases we're getting, for example, um, well, I shouldn't give examples. The new cases we're getting, we're, we're deliberating at present on Equatorial Guinea, France, and I've been he heavily involved in that process. Um, it's a, very, it's a collegial court. It has good personal relations. There's no other disagreements, sometimes strong disagreements. They're not personalised, which is not, has not always been the case. So it's a, it's a good place to work. Would you say that the ICJ looks upon the Security Council as the analogue to a sovereign? No. Um, there isn't a sovereign, there isn't a single sovereign in the international system, and that's what defines the international system. The Security Council is not a substitute for a sovereign, not even a surrogate. The Security Council has vital roles in the peace and security field, and the court is very careful to align itself with the Security Council on matters in which the Security Council has spoken on a Chapter 7. <coughs> You spoke <coughs> very interestingly about your own appointment to the court. Ray, the unsuccessful attempt by the UK to have Judge Greenwood re-elected. In this regard, it has been mooted that this election shows the UK's weakening influence in international affairs. Do you think there's an element of truth in this? I think I shouldn't comment on that. Understand. Um, was there any element of Brexit influence therein? Same, same answer. Well, Judge Crawford, all I can do at this point is thank you very much indeed for an immensely valuable and interesting account. I'm extremely grateful to you for making the time in your very busy schedule. I hope that tomorrow we can cover your scholarly work and I thank you again. Thank you very much. Okay, pleasure. Thank you very much for the care you've taken with it.